Okay. Um, so, for anyone who just joined, uh, we will be doing a lecture on some introductory arrow memes, which, by which I mean uh, category theory. Um, if you have, if you do get any questions, then please don't hesitate to ask in voice chat. I also have the text, uh, the text channel open, so I will be reading that as well. But unfortunately, I'm not able to include the text channel in, in the recording, so I'll have to read the questions out loud. Um, also, I would prefer if you use push to talk. Yeah. So, category theory. Um, category theory is uh, sometimes jokingly called generalized ab abstract nonsense, and uh, that description isn't totally wrong. Uh, in category theory, we care about structure and not so much about meaning. We care uh, about how things relate to other things as opposed to what things are made of. By abstracting from meaning of specific things, we are able to make some very general statements. And um, our, the, the definitions that we can make using this, like, all this generality, these, defini this, these definitions apply in a really broad variety of cases. Um, the definitions of category theory are often called uh, categorical language. Uh, right, categorical language, uh, and it the categorical language is actually uh, ubiquitous in mathematics in the sense that in most fields you can find some way in which categorical definitions can be used, and because categorical definitions are so um, general, you might find some interesting connections between different parts of between different parts of math. Um, another another thing that category theory does is uh, formalize some tricky notions. And um, for example, if you are familiar with linear algebra, you would know that. A vector space V is, an, is isomorphic to its dual, but also, well, for a finite, ve finite dimensional vector space, but also it is isomorphic to its double dual, and somehow the second isomorphism is um, different from the first one, um, like it is somehow canonical, um, independent of the choice of the vector space, um, like you can make these vague statements, like it's independent of the choice of the basis or something. Um, now, category theory um, has the definitions to make this idea rigorous, though that's not exactly what we are going to be talking about today. Today, we are going to be talking about a different idea called universality and universal properties. Uh, the gist is that if you have some, if you consider things that satisfy some property, uh, it might be the case that one of the things is somehow universal in that all other things satisfying the property can be factored through that universal thing, can be represented using that universal thing. Um, on that note, let's begin with some definitions. So, a category. Um, a category is a set of, so, okay, a category C is a set of objects, ob of C. Um, normally, you would note how this is not necessarily a set, but for all purposes about which we care, we can say that this is a set and not run into any issues. So um, now for any 
object for any object x uh, for any object x and y we have the set of morphisms denoted hom c from x to y uh, this is sometimes denoted c of x y or when we know exactly which category we are talking about just hom of x and y um, Um, instead of saying F is in HOM X and Y, we usually just say F is a morphism from X to Y. Um, these are the same by definition. Um, now, another thing a category has is a law of composition. If we have some morphism from X to Y and a morphism from Y to Z, then we should be able to form a so-called composition denoted G composition F, which should be a morphism from X to Z. Uh, it is also sometimes denoted just GF. Um, Right, the composition should be associative, uh, which is to say F composition G composition H should equal F composition G composition H. Um, whenever these compositions exist, uh, and since these are equal, we can just say F composition, G composition, H without any parentheses, without being ambiguous. Uh, another thing that categories have is identities. For any object X, uh, there is a um, distinguished morphism called ID X, sometimes just ID, uh, from X to itself. And um, the ident the, the, yeah, this is called the identity. The identity morphism acts as a unity for compositions. So for all, uh, for all F from X to Y, um, F composition ID X is equal to F, yeah, equal to uh, ID Y composition F. For some reason, it doesn't like this part of the screen. Well, no, it doesn't like the pen at all. Um, yeah, now, one thing I forgot to mention is that if we have a morphism uh, from F from X to Y, Uh, X is called the domain of F or the source of F. We write X is the domain of F and Y is the codomain or the target of F. Okay, um, now let's look at some examples of categories. Um, the category of sets. The objects in this category are um, is a morphism just is a morphism just a mapping, kind of. We will get to that a bit later. In the category of sets, objects are sets. Uh, um, it, X is a set. Therefore, X is an ob set. Um, morphisms. If we have two sets, X and Y, then the morphisms from X to Y are all functions, regular set functions uh, from X to Y. Um, 
composition of functions is defined as, well, composition. Um, F composition G is a function that maps X to F of G of X. Mm. This composition we defined is associative. So if we consider F composition G composition H applied to some X that equals by definition F composition G of H of X, which is the same as F of G of H of X, which is F of G composition H of X, which is F composition G composition H of X. Now, since um, these two functions return, uh, return the same value for all inputs X, this is true for all X, um, they must be the same function. So associativity works. Um, identities. Uh, for all, for any set X, um, I should make this clearer. This X is an element, uh, element of the domain of H. Um, for any set X, um, we may form a function ID from X to X, which is defined as ID of little x equals little x. Um, and um, it is easy to verify that F composition ID uh, of x equals F of ID of x equals F of x. And uh, by similar argument, well, this equals ID of F of X, which equals ID composition F of X. Now, again, these three functions map the same input to the same output, therefore they're all the same function. Uh, why do we need an ID if it just gives the same thing? Um, it is part of the idea of the category. Uh, we have composition and we need something to be the unit of composition. We need something that changes nothing when composed. It is just a thing we desire to have. Um, uh, any questions so far? A lot of people are typing. Yeah, it is similar to the number zero. It is similar to how the sum of no numbers is zero. In the same way, composition of no functions is the identity. Okay, um, I'm gonna move on to. Um, if you're familiar with some if not linear algebra, then at least some vector and matrix calculus. Uh, you might know what vector spaces are. So we consider the category of finite dimensional vector spaces over the real numbers. So, well, if you don't know what the what, what vector spaces are, for example, R to the three is the set of all triples of real numbers that is the set of all three-dimensional vectors with addition and scalar multiplication on them defined. And uh, um, the collection of all finite dimensional vector spaces is really just the connection of correct, the collection of R to the N for all N. Um, uh, so, as, as I said, um, 
objects of this thing are vector spaces over R. Um, morphisms. If we have a vector space U and a vector space V, uh, these are not distinguishable. Uh, we consider linear maps from U to V. Um, linear means that f of alpha x for some vector x and scalar alpha and beta y plus beta y equals alpha f of x plus beta beta f of y where alpha and beta are scalars that is real numbers and x and y uh, should be includes um, are elements of the vector space u so just vectors um, linear okay um, composition is just um, Paco you uh, <clears throat> isn't a linear map not changing the vector space therefore it should be f from u to u you're thinking of a linear transformation Linear maps can actually go between different spaces. And they are defined by this property. Mm, okay. Um, if we have two linear maps, F and G, then we can form their composition the same way we did for sets. But we will have to... Um, prove prove that their composition is also a linear map so suppose we have f composition g of x equal to f of g of x now mm, suppose we have f composition g of alpha x plus beta y that's f of g of alpha x plus beta y, which is f of alpha g x plus beta g y, because g is linear. And uh, now f is also linear, so this is alpha f of g of x plus beta f of g of y, which is alpha f composition g of x, plus beta f composition g of y. Hmm. Um, this proves that the composition of two morphisms is also a morphism. Now, uh, associativity of such composition is actually trivial because linear maps are necessarily functions and we've already shown that fun composition of function is associative. Um, so the identity uh, is the same as in functions. ID of X is X. And the fact that identity is a unit for composition also trivially follows from the same thing with functions. Now, those of you who already know what a group is uh, might consider the category of where objects are groups and morphisms are group homomorphisms. And uh, you would actually do like all the properties are, are proven really similar to what's going on here. Now, these examples are categories where objects are like sets in the sense that um, they're sets with extra structure and morphisms are functions with extra structure 
uh, actually functions preserving the DAX2 structure. Such categories are called concrete, and uh, it's important to know that not all categories are concrete. It's important to know some examples of non-concrete categories. So here's an example that is very different. Um, I will not give this category. Um, point of proving number three. Yes, exactly. Uh, is the point of proving number three to show that composition is in the home? Yes, exactly. That what we that's exactly what we're doing here. Um, so here's another category. Suppose U is a set. Now, suppose um, consider consider the set of all subsets of U. So um, X in uh, it, X is an object. If X is a subset of U, of U. Mm, now, for for more for morphisms, we will do something completely different. We will say that if X is a subset of Y, where X and Y are both subsets of U, if X is a subset of Y then there exists a unique morphism from x to y. Uh, we don't really say what the morphism is because we don't care. We just say that there exists one morphism from x to y. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, uh, there are no morphisms from X to Y. Um, Metal, you, you will be able to watch the recording. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. If X, X is a subset of Y, then there is exactly one morphism in the home set from x to y, otherwise there are no morphisms from x to y. Um, for composition, if we have x a subset of y and y a subset of z, yes, we, we are currently defining a category for an arbitrary set u. The objects are subsets of u. And uh, yeah, so if X is a subset of Y and Y is a subset of Z, that is, if there exists a morphism from X to Y and a morphism from Y to Z, then necessarily X is a subset of Z, and thus there exists a unique morphism from X to Z. Um, we will consider this morphism to be composition of these two. Again, we don't really give these morphisms a name because they are unique. Um, associativity follows trivially because whenever two morphisms are in the same home set, there are, they are the same morphism. So we don't even bother with checking. Uh, for any set subset X, X is a subset of X itself. Therefore, there exists a unique morphism from X to itself. Now, we define the identity to be that morphism. And again, the fact that the identity is a unit follows trivially because there aren't different morphisms to be not equal. Um, in more generality there are things called pre-orders um, if we have some set s and we have some relation which i will denote by this symbol um, relation on s which is um, 
reflexive um, for all a a is less than or equal to a and transitive uh, for all a b c um, a is less than b and b is less than c implies that a is less than or equal to c kind of like this so um, a relation that satisfies these two conditions is called a pre-order um, for any such relation we can consider a category whose objects are elements of s and um, do the same construction where a morphism exists exactly when so like um, we could consider a category where objects are elements of s so the the set of objects is equal to s and then a um, the set of morphisms from x to y is a singleton set which i will denote by this bullet um, exactly when x is less than or equal to y so if you're familiar with set build orientation this just says that the set has one element this circle thingy we don't really care what the circle thing is um, when x is less than or equal to y otherwise the set is empty um, the reflexivity ensures that there always exists a morphism from a to itself and thus we are able to have identities and transitivity ensures that we can always compose two morphisms and thus this defines a category which which is often denoted s with a subscript um, it's called the category of s under the relation less than or equal to um, so the category the category we defined on the previous page of subsets of U could be said to be the power set of U or the subsets of U under inclusion. The power set because the the set of objects X and ob like we could say that objects are the power set of U. Um. Another example we could we could have is the set of natural numbers under the relation of being less than or equal to as numbers. You probably know that. And in this category, the objects are are the natural numbers. Um, now, let's talk about who is echoing. Let's talk about commutative diagrams. So one of the very powerful things in the categorical language thing are commutative diagrams. A commutative diagram is really just a graphical way of representing some equations and um, really just how some objects and morphisms are related to each other. A diagram is a directed graph where vertices are objects of some category and arrows are morphisms between the respective objects. For example, a commutative diagram might look like this. Uh, This is called a commutative square. The, the arrows might be labeled, though not necessarily. And um, now this is called a diagram. And when we say that a diagram commutes, we mean that 
for any two vertices in the diagram, any two paths we are able to find between those vertices must compose to the same morphism. So, for example, in this diagram, there are two paths um, from D to A. There's this path, which is G composition P, and then there is this path, which is uh, F composition Q. To say that this diagram commutes would be to say that these compositions are equal as morphisms from D to A. Now, a point worth mentioning is that um, an empty path, that is a path from, from a vertex to itself, is considered to be the identity, which is getting back to the point for why we need identities. In some categories, you will have empty paths for, um, you know, to show, to, to state that the diagram commutes. Uh, sometimes we, we might talk about parts of a diagram commuting, like if there are several um, shapes to a diagram. Now, if a diagram is a plan, planar graph, then to say that, a, that the diagram commutes, it is sufficient to verify that all the faces of the graph commute. So, for example, if we have some diagram that looks like, I don't know, um, if we have something like this, to verify that this diagram commutes, it is sufficient to verify that this square commutes, this triangle commutes, and this triangle commutes. You can you can show that is sufficient to, to, to verify to verify that any paths like are equal whatever um, there are some other notations you might encounter in commutative diagrams and I will explain some of them um, okay let's define our first concept which is independent of the category we're working with that is monomorphisms a morphism f from x to y is called a monomorphism um monomorphism also sometimes called uh, monic or just mono um, if uh, for any object Z and for any morphisms G1 and G2 from Z to X parallel, these morphisms are parallel, um, if F composition G1 equals F composition G2, then G1 equals G2. Or, which is the same, uh, if G1 does not equal G2, then necessarily F composition G1 does not equal F composition G2. Um, the monomorphisms are sometimes called cancellative on the left, which is like this property here that, yeah, if we know that these two things are equal, we can cancel F on the left and conclude that these two things are equal. Um, now, monomorphisms are kind of related to injective things. For example, in the category of sets, monomorphisms are exactly the injective functions. That is actually one of the exercises I've posted in, in, the, in, the, in the problems. Um, in vector spaces, 
also monomorphisms are injective functions. Um, in the pre-order categories, which we've considered, all morphisms are monomorphisms because G1 equals G2, uh, G1 doesn't equal G2 is actually impossible because any parallel morphisms are equal. Um, so this implication holds vacuously. Um, you might think that monomorphisms are, and injective things are actually the same thing, but it's, it's not exactly true. But I am unable to show a simple enough counterexample to this. The, the, there are definitely counterexamples to this. Um, a closer notion to injectivity is a split monomorphism. Um, so a, a, a morphism from X to Y is called a split monomorphism if uh, there exists a function, well, a morphism R going in the opposite direction such that uh, our composition F is equal to the identity on X. Um, the R is called the retract. So a so F is a split monomorphism if it has a retract, which is a function that composes with it on one side uh, to form the identity. Um, this is kind of well related to left inverses. Um, we might uh, state this equality with a commutative diagram that looks like this. Uh, from X to Y, we have a morphism F, and we have X, and a morphism that goes like this, and we have an, the identity morphism going downwards. Um, now, why is it called a split monomorphism? Because a split monomorphism is... Uh, Retract doesn't equal left inverse. Uh, it kind of does. That's exactly what the left inverse is. Uh, maybe we see an example of a category with rat, with a retract. Um, sets in sets, all monomorphisms are split. So anything with a left inverse is like a split monomorphism. Um, but yeah, like, like I was saying, uh, retracts are left inverses. So in sets, yeah, in, in sets you have whenever your morphism, whenever your function has a left inverse, categorically it would be a retract. Um, so a split monomorphism is necessarily a monomorphism because if you have F composition G1 equal to F composition G2, then necessarily R composition F composition G1 equals R composition F composition G2, because we just compose R on the left. And R composition F is equal to identity composition G1 equals identity composition G2, and thus G1 is equal to G2. Um, uh, uh, like this. Mm. So yeah, a split monomorphism is a monomorphism, hence they share the same thing in the name. Um, now, the opposite notion, oh yeah, uh, there are plenty of properties that monomorphisms and split monomorphisms have that I will not exactly go over now. So for example, a composition of monomorphisms in a mo is a monomorphism. And if, uh, if a composition of two morphisms is a monomorphism, then 
necessarily the right one is a monomorphism. But yeah, I will I will come up with some exercises and post them. Now, the opposite notion is that of epimorphisms, also known as epi or epic, epic morphisms. Um, f from x to y is called epic. Uh, and uh, if for all G1 and G2, from Y to Z, yeah, for all Z, from Y to Z, so now we have on the other end, um, G1 composition F equals G2 composition F implies G1 equal G2. So now we are able to cancel on the right. And uh, this is related to surjectivity, but then again, not exactly. So uh, in sets and vector spaces, this is exactly a, this is exactly surjective functions. Uh, again, in pre-orders, all morphisms are epimorphisms because, well, because again, there are G one always equals G two. There is only one morphism in each in each home set. Um, uh, but if it, okay, so if you know what rings are, then the inclusion of the ring of integers in the ring of rationals is a morphism that is epic but not surjective so here's like if you know what this is this is where the analogy breaks down unfortunately i don't know any simpler counterexamples so if you don't know what rings are you have to, you'll have to build with me on that in rings. Uh, okay, split epimorphisms are defined in ag uh, analogously. Analogously, um, f from x to y is a split epi. Um, there exists a morphism s going in the opposite direction. This is called a section uh, such that f composition s equals i d y. So here s is a right inverse for f. Um, yeah. Now, yeah, I also forgot to mention um, f. Yeah, monomorphisms in commutative diagrams are denoted by an arrow with a hook. And epimorphisms in commutative diagrams are denoted by an arrow with a double tip. Uh, okay. Wait. Now, if we have... Oh yeah, we were talking about how epimorphisms are kind of the opposite of uh, monomorphisms. Now, there's a way to, to formalize this. Um, in category theory, we have a thing called the opposite category. Opposite category. Um, if we have some category C, we can form a category with all arrows reversed. That's the idea. So the objects, yeah, we will form a category called C op um, with arrows reversed. The objects of C op, C opposite are exactly the same as the objects of C, but 
the homomorphisms in C op from X to Y are the homomorphisms of C from Y to X. This is the important thing. X on the left, X on the right. Y on the left, Y on whatever. You see. Um, now, composition has to be carried out in opposite order. So if we have F from X to Y in the opposite world, that is, it is from Y to X in the original category, and we have a G from Uh, what? Z to X in the opposite world, that is from X to Z in the original category, then we can form a composition G composition F, which would go from Y to Z and uh, this would be the F composition opposite G. Uh, I should not write it like that. G composition opposite. And it will go from Z to Y. Now, X to Y. Oh, shit. This is a G. Um, hopefully you can see what's going on here. We have G from Z to X in the opposite world and F from X to Y in the opposite world. So F composition G in the opposite world is from Z to Y and it equals G regular composition F in the original category. Now associativity is easily checked using this definition. Um, identities in the opposite world are just the same because well flipping like if we if we are talking about a, a morphism from an object to itself and flipping the arrow kind of does nothing um, the unital properties of the identity are also trivial now if we have a category and flip its arrows twice then we get back the original thing and um, a way to formalize what I was talking about earlier is that is is that F is mono in C if and only if F is epi in C op. So whenever something like this happens, we call the the two concepts dual because um, well, we have two, con two categories C and C op, uh, we, and we can go between them by flipping the arrows. And uh, yeah, in general, in general, concepts are called dual if one can be obtained from the other by reversing all the arrows in the definition. And concepts like due, due to this very ubiquitous uh, dual thingy. Um, due to this very ubiquitous dual thingy, concepts often come in pairs. And um, whenever we come up, we've come up with some name for a concept, but like we, we've come up with a name for something, and uh, we don't have a good name for the dual concept, we might just call it a co something. You've probably heard of this. Where were we? Um, opposite category, co-things. Yeah, co-things. Very ubiquitous in category theory. Um, let's talk about isomorphisms. Um, 
So, um, suppose that F is some morphism such that it has both a retract and a section. Now, instead of drawing the equations, I will draw a commuting diagram. Um, X to Y, this is F, this is the retract, this is the section, and we have this identity going up, this identity going up. Yes, retracts and sections are morphisms in the same category. Because like if we if you look back at the definition of this category, for example, with subsets, like what else would morphisms be? Like um, again, it's very important to recognize um, categories where morphisms aren't really functions. Um, yeah, so R, R is a re retract for F. Therefore, this triangle commutes. This triangle thing commutes uh, by the definition of a retract. And uh, if S is a section, then this triangle commutes by the definition of a section. Therefore, this whole diagram commutes. And um, any path for any two paths between the same node, we can find the path. The paths must be equal, so we are able to find two paths from this y to this x. This is uh, our composition ID, and the other path is this path, which is ID composition S. Now, because this diagram commutes, they must necessarily be the same, and the, by the property of identity, this is equal to R and this is equal to S. Therefore, R and S are the same morphism. Now, so what this is saying is, if a morphism has both a retract and a section, then they are the same. Um, so we can define a, an isomorphism, F is an isomorphism, if there exists a function that goes in the opposite direction, um, in the opposite direction, such that it is both a left inverse, er, both a right inverse, and a left inverse. So what we just proved above is the statement that if a morphism is both a split monomorphism and a split epimorphism, then it is an isomorphism. The H thing is called the inverse of F. And uh, we the these equations might be stated in a very absurd looking commutative diagram that looks like this so this is where the empty paths get useful um so what we are saying is that the uh empty path from x to itself the identity uh, wrong equation, the identity is equal to this roundabout path, which is this thing, and similar for y. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, if h is an inverse for f, then f is an inverse for h, so isomorphism, so inverses kind of come in pairs. Mm. And whenever, so 
the objects X and Y in this situation are called isomorphic. So objects are isomorphic whenever there exists some isomorphism, isomorphism between them. Um, now, let's talk about terminal objects. Terminal. Um, an object T in some category C is called terminal if for all x for any other object uh, there exists a unique uh, morphism um, morphism uh, from x to t this morphism is for strange reasons denoted with an exclamation mark. Um, I will put it in quotes so that you... Um, yeah. Um, now, what does this, what does this mean? Um, in sets, for example, any, any set with exactly one element for example, this set with a circle in it is a terminal object. And uh, whenever there is another set X, you can form a function from X to that set, which sends everything to that unique element. So it's the constant function. Right? Does that make sense? In vector spaces, the terminal object is the null space. Uh, it's not an empty set. That's the. This should, this should be more elliptical. Oh no! <laughs> Shit. Uh, no, it's. Slightly pen. Um, the null vector space with a morphism that sends every vector to zero. Um, now, what can we say about the subsets under inclusion? So it is some set which anything else is a subset of. So uh, x is a subset of t for all x. Now, this is just the, oh, not x. This is just the universe of discourse, the full set. Someone answered me, never mind. Um, the full set. Now, in this part is clear. In natural numbers under the less than or equal to components, no spaces for finite vector spaces with components R. Are you saying that the null space is a terminal object? Yes. The space with exactly one vector, which is the zero vector, is the terminal object. Now, for n under the less than or equal to ordering, there is no terminal object. So, so to say that some number t is a terminal object would be to claim that for any number n, n is less than or equal to t, which is impossible. Therefore, um, no terminal object. Um, now let's prove a 
an interesting theorem. Ivan, I will get to that later. Um, let's prove an interesting theorem. Suppose some category C has two terminal objects, T1 and T2. We will show that T1 and T2 are isomorphic, and the isomorphism between them is unique. Now, oh yeah, I totally forgot. Um, for the terminal object, we can draw a diagram that looks like this. X dashed arrow T. The dashed arrow means that the morphism is unique for, well, unique satisfying whatever is clear from the context. Okay, now if we have two terminal objects, T1 and T2, um, I will use some colors. We have a unique morphism like this and a unique morphism like this. Both are unfortunately named the same. But also, um, consider, consider, uh, yeah, the red morphisms, red morphism exists because T2 is a terminal object, and the green morphism exists because T1 is a terminal object. Um, but also, T1 is a terminal object, therefore, there exists a unique morphism from it to itself. And emphasis on unique. But there also exists a morphism from T1 to itself called the identity. So, the blue exclamation mark is equal to the identity on T1. Um, now, if we consider the composite morphism green uh, composition red, it goes from T1 to itself, yeah, this is going from T1 to T1. Uh, this composite morphism goes from T1 to itself, but the blue exclamation mark is the unique morphism from T1 to itself. Therefore, these are necessarily also equal. So, this composition is equal to the identity and by a similar proof, the other composition uh, is equal to the identity on T2. Therefore, the green and the red, red morphisms are inverses of each other. So, T1 and T2 are isomorphic. T1 and T2 are isomorphic. Um, now, the red morphism is the only morphism that goes from T1 to T2, and the green morphism is the only morphism that goes in the opposite direction. So, these are necessarily, so this is necessarily the only isomorphism between them. And so, we've proved that T1 are isomorphic. No, um, so, uh, T1 are isomorphic. Uh, oh, yeah. We proved that um, terminal objects are, quote, unique up to a unique isomorphism. Wow, this is a really 
not the sensitive part of the tablet. Um, and um, this theme of unique up to unique isomorphism is actually very common in category theory. You could even say that it kind of captures the essence of category theory because we don't really care about about the specific identities of objects. Um, I, what I mean is we don't care whether two objects are the same. We care about how the objects are connected to other objects. And if the objects are isomorphic, then they are connected to all the, all the other objects in the same way. And um, I uh, so here's the thing that I wish I was told earlier when learning category theory. Um, we don't really care about whether two objects are the same, but, ra but we care very much about whether two morphism, uh, morphisms are the same. Um, so the opposite notion of... Um, well, that's, that's not uh, the opposite notion of terminal object is the initial object. Um, you could. Um, I'm. I'm going to leave the definition and the similar proof and some properties of the initial object as an exercise to the, well, listener. Um, also going to leave as an exercise uh, constructing exactly what are initial objects in some categories we've um, described, and also why it is denoted zero, while the terminal, or why the, the terminal object is um, denoted one. Um, someone is typing. What, what are you typing? Well, um, the proof is exactly the same, but all the arrows are reversed. That's why the proof is not interesting. Like I said, uh, things come in pairs in category theory, usually. Um, and we can get away with proving things for only half of them. The opposite proof is the same. Um, Okay, now let's construct a thing called a product. Now, this is where it gets interesting. Suppose we have some category C, and A and B are some fixed objects in C. Um, the product of A and B is some object denoted a times b such that yeah the object comes together with two morphisms one into a called pi one usually called pi one another into b called pi two um the morphisms are called projections and it has to satisfy a property for any other object. So, okay, we have pi 1 and uh, pi 2. For any other object C with morphisms going like this, there exists... Wow, well, that's crippled exists. There exists a unique morphism H that goes like this. Uh, yeah, this 
this is the P, this is the Q. There exists a unique morphism H such that the diagram commutes. This is the definition of a product. An object, A times B, with two projections, such that for any other objects with two functions like this, uh, there is a unique morphism from that object to the product, such that these two triangles commute. Um, yeah, to make sure we are on the same page, the diagram commuting means that P equals pi 1 composition H, Q equals pi 2 composition H. Um, in sets, this is exactly the Cartesian product. Um, pi 1 and pi 2 are functions. Uh, let me separate. Um, pi 1 is a function that to the pair uh, not a and b, get let me be a and b. Uh, a and b gives a and pi 2 for a pair a and b gives b. Um, these are these functions. And if we have a pair of morphisms P and Q for some, for some uh, set C, we can define a function H of C, some C and C, uh, by a pair of P of C and Q of C. Um, it is easy to see that this H will ver will satisfy this equation. And uh, you can also see that this definition kind of, um, okay, this equation kind of means that H is the only possible such morphism. Um, yeah. So Cartesian products are categorical products in the category of sets. In finite vector spaces over R, the Cartesian product is the direct sum. Uh, you can kind of see the similarity because you, you can treat a direct sum of two vector spaces as the vector space of pairs. And uh, projections are defined in literally the same way and this H morphism is defined in literally the same way. Um, now, a more interesting question is, this was supposed to fit in the same slide, um, what is the product in the category of sets under inclusion? So suppose we have some universe U and we have some sets A subset of U and B subset of U. We are interested in finding the set A times B so um, I will include the, the diagram for reference. A times B into B and into A and for any C such that, such that there exists this. Um, so A times B has to be a subset of A and A times B has to be a subset of B. Therefore, uh, A times B is a subset of their intersection. Now, um, for any object C that is also a subset of A and a subset of B, uh, that is C is a subset of A intersection B, uh, it must follow that uh, C is a subset of A times B. Now, this is only possible if A times B is equal to A intersection B. So, it is the largest set that fits within the intersection of A and B, so it must be in the intersection of A and B. Um, let's see, take this. So, in the 
pre-order of subsets under inclusion, product is intersection. Interestingly. Um, now, uh, this was for power set of view under inclusion. Now, if we consider the natural numbers under less than, suppose we have A and B, some natural numbers. Suppose, so we are asked to find some number A times B. Uh, now, this has nothing to do with multiplication of natural numbers. Uh, A times B, which is less than or equal to A and a times b less than or equal to b so by the same idea a times b is less than or equal to the minimum of a and b and by literally the same idea uh for all c which are less than or equal to the minimum of a and b uh it must follow that c is less than a times b and thus we conclude that this number we are after is actually the minimum of a times b. Again, remember that this cross here has nothing to do with multiplication, it's just a category of product. And in this category, it turns out that the product of two numbers is their minimum. Um, so, uh, I hope so far it's clear. Um, also, like, you've seen that terminal objects sometimes don't exist, sometimes products don't exist. It's easy to construct an example. Uh, a category doesn't have to be connected. There isn't necessarily a path between two objects. And in that case, there is no product between two disconnected objects. Um, now, right, a product, the, a product is also unique up to a unique, so once we've fixed some a and b, a product is also unique up to a unique isomorphism. Um, why? Uh, because this h here, which is a unique thing that makes these things commute like we can build literally the same proof as we did here but with the h thing uh, great seminar are you being ironical um, uh, yeah um, this is an example of a universal property. So we consider all objects with the property that they have two morphisms, one into A, one into B. And we consider the universal objects, object that is A times B, such, and the universality is that any other object satisfying the property factors through it with this H morphism. So this is the idea of universality. Um, if we go back to the definition of the terminal objects, terminal object, if you squint your eyes, you can kind of see how T is a universal object satisfying the property of just being there. For any other object that is just there, it factors through T with this unique morphism. Now, the reason I didn't mention it immediately is because it's kind of, you, you, you need to squint your eyes. So it's not really, it's, it's an edge case, but it is a universal property and a universal object satisfying that property. Um, so now let's do something spicy. Um, products are terminal objects. Um, of course, 
not in the same category. What we're going to do is consider a category C uh, and then construct an auxiliary category such that a product, a, a, an object is a product in C uh, exactly when it is a terminal object in the auxiliary category. So suppose we have fixed some objects A and B. Now we consider a category which I will call C A B. The objects in this thing are commutative diagrams, well, not commutative, are diagrams that look like this. So the objects are triples, x, p, q, with the condition that p and q will go between the right objects. Um, the morphisms, if we have two object, two two objects of this weird category. Well, that's a weird B. Uh, if we have two objects, morphism between two such things is a morphism from X to Y in the original category that makes these this diagram commute. Um, it is easy to see that the, well, composition is obviously defined by composing these H things. It's easy to see that it is associative. It's easy to see that identity from X to itself satisfies this commutative diagram. And the identity, well, is the unit of composition. So this is indeed a category. Um, now, what is a, oh yeah, for those of you who know some arrow memes, uh, this is uh, more widely known as C times C comma A times B. This is a comma category, but in this case, it's also known as a slice category over the, the pair A and B. Um, now, what does it mean for an object to be terminal in this category? So we have some object T with a pair of morphisms. And for any other object X with a pair of morphisms, there exists a unique morphism Oh yeah, this shouldn't be dashed because we are not talking about uniqueness. Um, there exists a unique morphism that makes the diagram commute. Um, now, this is exactly the commutative diagram for a product. So, T is necessarily the direct product of N and B. So, direct product in C and the T is in C A B. Um, did anyone understand a thing? Yes, no. Great. Uh, um, now let's consider well you can consider the dual notion of product and we don't have a better name for it other than the co-product i'm just gonna quickly run over the definition uh we have an object called a plus b with morphisms from b and from a called i1 and i2 they are usually called injections because they are usually injective and for any other object c with two morphisms in a similar fashion there exists a unique morphism that, that makes a diagram create now in set 
this is where it gets interesting because if A and B are disjoint, then the co-product of these two sets is just their union. However, if A and B do intersect, then this doesn't work anymore. We need to make sure that A and B are disjoint. And one of the ways we do this is by considering, by modifying, by making copies of A and B in a way that they're such that they're at disjoint. For example, by doing something like this. This is called a tagged union, sometimes used in programming. So now these two sets are in some, sen in some sense exactly the same as the original, but now they are necessarily disjoint. And um, now we can take their union to be the co-product. Um, and this is where category theory kind of leaks into regular, regular mathematics because um, we've just considered two sets, but not exactly. So A is not the same set as, zero, as this thing, but it is related to all other sets in the same way. So these two sets are isomorphic. And in the same sense, the uh, co-product of two sets isn't really a specific set. There isn't really a satisfying definition of a co-product that is a well-behaved thing. But what matters is that the co-product of two sets is unique up to a unique isomorphism. And, um, well, we say that a co-product is a class of sets, so to speak that are related to A and B in the right way. So in this case, uh, the union of 0 times A and 1 times B can act as a co-product for A and B, but this is not really a nice definition. So if A and B are disjoint, we would be compelled to use the top definition but they are the same. They're isomorphic. So, well, why are they isomorphic? The same construction as uh, for the product. Um, uh, I guess. Uh, for finite vector spaces, the co-product is also the, what is it called, the direct sum. So for finite vector spaces, the product and the co-product are the same. I'm not going to go into much detail as to why. Um, for sets under inclusion, this is the union, in this case, regular union without any weird oddities. And for natural numbers under less than, this is the maximum. Again, the constructions are similar as in this slide. Hopefully you can see the connection. Now, um, I see that there's not too many people left. And this is a point where I can make a break and continue in a later seminar. Uh, which is, I think that's what I'm going to do. I see people leaving and stuff like that. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions that have that they have not yet asked, please do. Okay. This is where we are going to stop then.